So we make a, a very affordable, world-class quality hearing aid. You know, it's perfect for the working class around the world. For many who come to the hospital, recovery doesn't just involve surgery. It also means overcoming the psychological scars of war and learning to use their bodies again. Over 360 million people around the world suffer from disabling hearing loss, with the majority living in low and middle income countries. Now while hearing aids can make a huge difference, the reality is that globally, just 10% of people who need these devices can actually get access to them. I'm Dr. Goody Singh and I'm here in Brazil to learn how low-cost hearing technologies are improving the options for those most in need. Solar Ear is a social business based in Sao Paulo that makes low-cost devices to diagnose and treat hearing loss. They've been approached by the mother of a three-year-old boy who is suspected of having problems with his hearing. What were the first signals to you that there might be something different about Brian's hearing? <laughs> Brian faced up to a three-year wait for free government care, and the delay could have severely limited his ability to talk. He was referred to solar ear by an audiologist. What does it mean for these children who are not diagnosed and so they're caught very late? Ela não vai desenvolver fala, ela não vai desenvolver linguagem. É... Ela tem a tendência a se isolar do mundo. Quanto mais tardio é diagnosticado a perda auditiva, mais dificuldade essa criança vai ter. One of Solar Ear's latest developments is a hearing test app for smartphones. The app is still in development, but the aim is for people with no access to a trained audiologist to have the opportunity to test themselves or their family for hearing loss. Sibeli is testing the app on Brian at his home to see how it works outside of an audiology clinic. This test, a criança tem, ele vai vai ter um 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 aviso sonoro que é um um apito, um tom puro, tá? Se a criança ouvir É, ela vai trazer o ovinho para o lado que, que indica que ela ouviu, se não, vai para o outro lado. Vai diminuindo gradativamente os limiares, como uma audiometria normal, tá? vai diminuindo, e vai chegar um momento que ela não vai escutar mais, e esse vai ser o limiar de audibilidade da criança. O que indica no, no, nessa triagem que foi feita É que o Brian, ele tem uma perda auditiva severa, profunda, tá? Os limiares de audibilidade dele são bem baixos. Brian's results will be analyzed and an appropriate hearing device selected. He will then visit Solar Ear to receive his hearing aid. Solar Ear's hearing aids use either solar power or household light to charge the hearing aid batteries. A battery costs, let's say, about a, a pound, a British pound, right. and lasts about a week. That's a fortunate. The sun charges two AA batteries. This keeps the power for a week. So once or twice a week, you take out your hearing aid battery, pop it in at night, and over the next morning, you have a fresh battery. So these batteries cost a pound and last two to three years versus one week. Solar Ears hearing aids are patent-free and open source which means that anyone around the world can use or adapt the designs at no cost. We buy the components from the hearing aids the same place as the big five companies do. There is no reason a hearing aid has to sell for a thousand pounds or 20,000 pounds. The component costs for this are 40 pounds. And social business is not just about replicating the activity making hearing aids. So we want to show that people who are deaf can do everything except hear. Solarira has sold 20,000 hearing aids and 40,000 solar chargers to charities, organizations and individuals all over the world. Brian is one of the latest recipients. Hi. Hello. Hi.
Brian? Ok. Não foi eu que te amei, não, mas tá bom. So we, we think that he heard you call his name that time. Ele sabe que tem um som, mas ele não sabe ainda de onde que vem, porque é a primeira vez que ele escuta. So human speech is incredibly complex. It's going to take time for the muscles in his tongue and his mouth, and also for his ears and his brain to get used to putting it all together and for the speech to make sense. So that's actually going to be something that will take a long time before he gets right. Na verdade, o Brian vai iniciar sua vida auditiva agora aos três anos. Ele vai conseguir escutar sons e com a terapia ele vai melhorando essa audição, porque tudo para ele agora é novo. Que? Que? Que ele vai estar tá mais bem mais inteligente, vai saber falar mais algumas coisas que ele já ele já tenta falar, né? Eu acho que ele já vai conseguir falar mais. Ah, porque ele quer se aparecer. Brian. <risos> agora eu acho que ele vai conseguir falar mãe, vó, tudo ele vai conseguir falar agora. Eu tô feliz. To save lives from diseases like cancer and TB, early detection is vital. Yet current medical practice still struggles to provide a definitive diagnosis even when a patient is already ill. But this is changing. And in a recent study, scientists from the University of Copenhagen were able to predict with 80% accuracy if women will get breast cancer in the future just by analyzing their blood. In the past, researchers tried to predict disease through a single biomarker, or indicator, used to measure the presence or progress of a disease. But this study assessed a wide range of biomarkers from data collected over two decades ago. Substances found in our blood such as cholesterol, amino acids and ethanol were used to create a metabolic blood profile. And by analyzing hundreds of blood profiles taken from women with and without cancer, the researchers were able to pinpoint specific small changes in blood, which over time go on to indicate a precancerous state. Early markers allow life-saving preventative measures, like lifestyle changes, tailored breast screening, risk-reducing drugs or surgery. Until now, there's been no reliable way to predict the chance of getting non-inherited breast cancer, which affects 9 out of 10 women who get cancer. So being able to predict it two to five years before it even develops has the potential to revolutionize the way we treat this disease and many others in the future. Over the past decade, conflicts in the Middle East have taken a huge toll on human life. Those people who survive the bombs and bullets can be left with incredibly complex injuries, which their country's beleaguered healthcare systems are in no position to treat. I'm Dr. Javed Abdelmunem in Amman, Jordan, to visit the only hospital in the Middle East that offers free reconstructive surgery to help rebuild the bodies and the lives of those injured in the violence. Squeezed in between Iraq, the occupied West Bank, and Syria, Jordan has become a regional safe house for people fleeing conflict in neighboring countries. Around 630,000 refugees from Syria alone live here, making up nearly 10% of Jordan's total population. The vast majority of Syrians live outside of refugee camps in urban areas such as the border town of Ramtha, where I've come to meet Hassan Sarhan and his family. <laughs> After living through two years of civil war, Hassan, his wife Lama Abazid, and their five children left Syria in 2013 after their family home was destroyed in an explosion. بتعمل شنو في الشارع وفي البيت الصاروخ ضرب البيت انا الصاروخ فات على الكريدور بالبيت وانا طلعت من الكريدور ما بعرف انه بناتي مصابات بس وانا نازل نزول يقولوا في بعد بنت هن معي انا معي ثلاث بنات وبعد بعد واحده يدوروا يدوروا بالاخير اجت دعاء وشفت اجرها مبتوره 
هي كانت بتمشي ولا كانت يعني في الارض تلعب تلعب بتلعب بتلعب بالبيت هي بتلعب بمي اه اه لكن لما انت لقيتيها لقوها لقوها تحت الغدب شهد صارت عندها كسر في الرقبه تفتت عظام كذا مشوا ميدان كانوا بيطروا لها جرها مره فضل دعاء اجرا بترت ساعه الاصابه مباشره راحت الجرى 3 year old Dua now wears a prosthetic limb as soon as the girls were strong enough they came here to Jordan only a few kilometers across the border from the Syrian town where their extended family still live amid intense fighting واحنا بالرمثة هون نسمع الطيران بسوريا الدرب والقواس الحرب اللي قايمة بسوريا صح ولا يومية؟ اه بشكل يومي احيانا يعني احيانا بتيجي قذائف تنزل هون بتقابل الرمثة اما المساء او الصبح جي الصبح كانك درع يعني كانك قاعد بسوريا Every week for the last two years, Hassan has made the journey with his daughters to a specialist medical center in the Jordanian capital Amman. Around 550 people from Syria, Iraq, Yemen, Gaza and Egypt come here each year to receive long-term care for complex war injuries from doctors working with the medical charity Médecins Sans Frontières or Doctors Without Borders. Here, top surgeons and therapists from the region treat patients with the most severe burns, facial injuries and limb damage, up to a fifth of whom are children. Iraqi orthopedic surgeon Dr. Rashid Fakhri has been involved in the project since it was first set up in 2006 in response to the war in Iraq, and he now coordinates all surgical activity. Uh, this is the hospital, so we are here in the surgery department. This is the second surgical ward, and yeah. then we have two floors for rehabilitation. Uh, the majority are uh, victims of war, so in Iraq they are the victims of, of most of them are bone car explosions. And in Syria also we face almost the same pattern. In Yemen it's a little bit different, it's more with, with bullet injuries rather than bone explosions. Most of the countries around us, they are at least they can offer the emergency surgeries at a good level. So most of the patients are well treated in the beginning. Uh, but then after that, and those patients are neglected in their home country. So that's why MSF is now sort of support for uh, these patients. I'm going to find Dr. Ashraf in clinic. He is the head surgeon and maxillofacial specialist of this unit. Palestinian Jordanian surgeon Dr. Ashraf Al Bustanji specializes in treating people with serious face and neck injuries who often need multiple surgeries over many years. He aims to get his patients to the point where they can not only function but also feel comfortable showing their face in public. So, this patient is also a victim of explosion. All this area, the soft tissue and bone, was missing. And this is dental implants. We are preparing him to have the teeth. اللي وراه نريد نفتح اكثر كمان حتى يصير فتحه اوسع حتى مين يجي يركب الاسنان يقدر يركب الاسنان عرفت شلون؟ I mean there's such specific injuries these if the shrapnel was just a few inches this way they, they wouldn't survive your carotids are gone yeah, exactly. if it's a bit higher the brain is the gone brain, yeah. so that's why you're getting these very specific mid face injuries we can put or... them yeah he will either die or will you know there will be some neurological deformity if it's lower hit one of these big vessels, they will not survive they will bleed and they will die that's so weird. somehow they are like 19-year-old Syrian, Mohammed Abdel Mohsen, was also severely injured in an explosion and is due to have his next reconstructive operation tomorrow. So, Mohammed, where are you from? And how long have you been in, in Jordan? About 14, 14 months. It's yeah. a while. And what was the injury initially? So this X-ray shows exactly the amount of bone defect. All this is missing bone. And this is only a plate that holds these two sides of the lower jaw together. It's pretty graphic to illustrate um, Mohammed's injuries. There is, there is no lower jaw whatsoever. His airway must have been compromised, <laughs> compromised when he was first injured. It's yes. a wonder he's alive yeah. at all. 
That's you? I can't go your name, I can't go to your name. Yeah. Direct, thank you for your support. After that, I was in the class. I was in the middle of the class. After that, I was in the middle of the class. في رمضان الماضي كنت أول مرة باكل فيها وأنا قاعد جاهز لبكرة إن شاء الله؟ إن شاء الله After being patched up in a field hospital in Syria, Mohammed arrived in Jordan in 2014 and has already been operated on five times by Dr. Ashraf. First, the surgeon joined Mohammed's lower jawbone together with a titanium plate. He then cut loose a strip of muscle from Mohammed's chest to cover the metal plate, leaving the blood supply connected to improve chances of the graft succeeding. After three weeks, the transplanted tissue was able to receive blood directly from the face, so the muscle was cut and the remainder stitched back onto the chest. The next step is to use bone from Mohammed's pelvis to rebuild his lower jaw, so he can eventually have teeth implants. So tomorrow, we will reconstruct the bone. It is a lengthy procedure, and it will be very important for him. I'm Jordanian by birth, but my family comes from uh, West Bank. So I can understand when suddenly you leave your home, as a Syrian, for example, your, your farm, your work, your friends, your family, and suddenly you are treated in a hospital in Amman. Nobody around you, different environment, everything. So I think I more understand it because something, you know, hidden in me. Many of the medics here share the experience of exile with their patients, having also been forced to flee the region's conflicts in search of a safe place to work and live. For many who come to the hospital, Recovery doesn't just involve surgery. It also means overcoming the psychological scars of war and learning to use their bodies again. Today, Dua has her first physiotherapy appointment using her new prosthetic leg. Hassan. تنام معها الطرف يعني تنيموا معها ما تخش حدا يقرب عليه مم. يعني مثل مثل اللعبة يعني هي تفكر لعبة مم. يعني بعمرها لأنه يعني لما ركبت كان عمرها سنة وثمان شهور بس What time is the physiotherapy today? العاد تقريبا لا بس طرف أبوي يلا بس لا <تصفيق> يلا أبوي مشان نروح we just do some modification for the processes. Do I have stump? obviously comes down to a, a sh quite a sharp bone, the shin bone, so that you can't really put too much pressure through that. It causes pain, it can aggravate the skin. So they've had to modify the leg just so that her knee is walked, walking slightly bent. So rather than walking on the stump, she's walking on a greater surface area. And that's why she needs this little modification. And when you do leg uh, walking training, are there special exercises or is it literally playing? She used to, uh, to have uh, a prosthesis before. So she is familiar with the, the mm. prosthesis. So oh, she's doing it, doing it without instruction. <laughs> so most of the session is uh, like a play time. Try to, to use her leg without. She recognizes that I'm mm. using my legs. Wahid. Nain. Talata. Arba. <laughs> She's doing fine. <laughs> Who would she be? doesn't need our help. <laughs> she can't do it. It seems that she is good. <laughs> she seems very good. Well, she's a good 
اتوقع ان شاء الله مستقبل يعني يكون الله يعوضها مستقبل حلو احسن يعني من بدال الجرح <تصفيق> While Dua continues with her physiotherapy, her sister Shahad has a class with the psychosocial counselor, Muntaha Mashayakh. These two sisters, when they just arrived to the project, started to get their treatment. Uh, we faced many problems because they were uh, traumatized. As Shahad was older when the bomb hit, she's experienced more severe psychological effects. When she even hear uh, the plain uh, voice, Sound and then, the, yeah, the sound, she starts screaming, uh, shouting, uh, because she keeps in her mind the, the explosion when it was yes. done. Yes, you can understand. Yes. <laughs> Shahad was also afraid of the doctors in white coats who were treating her leg injuries. First time she was crying and shouting and screaming. Second, third, fourth. And after uh, this period of time, she became more sociable, interact, play, talk, everything, yeah, huge uh, changes, really. While the bulk of Shahad and Dua's treatment here is now over, Muhammad's journey to recovery is still very much ongoing. It's going to be grafting a piece of bone from his somewhere around his pelvis and putting it into his jaw to make a new jawbone. Just preparing him for anesthetic. There's a lot of scar tissue. He's had so many operations. Even for me, it's sounding a bit too crunchy. It's around 11 centimeter bone defect. We uh -huh. will try to bridge all, all this defect. All around? Yeah. In one piece? In three pieces mainly. Dr. Ashraf chisels off the bone from the pelvis and screws it to the plate to reform Muhammad's lower jaw. After five hours, the surgery has been a success and all that's left to do is to stitch Muhammad back up. You can imagine with the number of patients yeah. that you have to treat, you could only aim for functional, but you go right to the end, the next step, cosmetic as well. Uh, you might give the patient the function that he had before uh, the injury, but still he's not happy. He is psychologically not functioning. Some of the patients, they don't want to leave the project because they are afraid to come outside. They are here with people like them, with distorted faces, with amputated limbs, with burns. So they see people like them. We have also to, to, to give the patient confidence and self-esteem. Five years from now, I hope that this patient, that he went back to his native city, Homs. Uh, he built a stable life. He is accepted by the community. He is married with children. And all the time, remember our staff here, our team, that we did something valuable for him. When this reconstructive surgery project began, it was supposed to be temporary, to deal with the fallout of war in Iraq. But since then, over 3,700 people have been treated, and the need shows no sign of abating. A testament both to the continuing horror of war and to the potential for healing. بعد ما الحادثة صارت وكذا ورجعت شفت انه يعني الحمد لله انه امورها مثل الطبيعي يعني ايش بكون شغله يعني الحمد لله 40 يعني مبسوط خيرات الله يعني